Well, hey folks, Jeff Salzman here. Today, I want to share some responses I've been getting from listeners, particularly around the podcasts I've been doing on Ukraine. The, the first response uh, that I want to share is a, a, an email that I got. And by the way, I, I love hearing from you. So if you are interested in a question or a comment or a challenge or a critique or anything, praise even, uh, you can write me at jeff at dailyevolver.com. And I don't always respond. I'm not a very good correspondent, but I read everything. So I'll read it if you send it. All right. So the first one is from a longtime listener, Alan. And it's a little bit about theory, but I think it really helps us to think about what we're doing in a more fruitful and complex way. And what he says is, here's a quick suggestion, Jeff. When you explain the various levels of consciousness, use the word simultaneous more often. It conveys the idea that integral wants it all, and it conveys the idea of include and transcend. Sometimes when you jump around from color level to color level, it can seem as if one turns the various levels on and off. The word simultaneous or simultaneity leaves no doubt in the mind of how all the levels are constantly and concurrently interacting. And I like that because they are all interacting and we are living in a world where there are more stages online than ever. So we have you know, post-modernity arising out of modernity and now integral consciousness arriving, arising out of post-modernity. Integral consciousness being the consciousness that wants to include all of the previous ones, just like Alan said, and recognize that in any individual human being and in any culture, uh, there are many different worldviews arising at the same time. I sometimes think of it as that we're, it's like when you have a radio and you're walking around listening to the radio or listening to the internet on your computer, on your phone, uh, got your headphones in and everywhere you go, there's every station, it's all there. The whole radio spectrum is everywhere at once. And then you're tuning in whatever station you want. And so there's really both things happening. We want to be able to recognize when there is, you know, one station broadcasting over all the others, modernity, traditionalism, post-modernity, whatever it might be. And at the same time, people have more than one going on at a time. Now, what I would also point out is that not everybody has the later stages. Some people are, you know, they essentially stop developing at traditionalism. Some cultures stop developing. And that's not to say that there aren't some people, there aren't some uh, energies that are from higher levels. But when we, um, when we define these levels, we're actually defining them as sort of probability clouds, where if you're operating at a traditional stage of development, most of your responses and ways of thinking are gonna come from that stage. They're gonna be mythic, they're gonna be ethnocentric, they're going to be religious often. Um, that's not to say, so that, that's gonna be maybe 40, 50%. You're gonna have 20% modern, you're gonna have some postmodern. you might even have some integral, you have some earlier stages. Uh, but these new stages are being, this is evolution. New stages are being laid down all the time. Applying that to what is going on in the news uh, is, you know, it, it, it's what I've been doing with talking about, I think the last podcast I did was called Putin's War on Modernity. And um, I think that's accurate. I think that one of the things that we can see from developmental theory is that Vladimir Putin is operating from somewhere between the mythic and magic level of development. Now he's rational too. He is also, you know, maybe even has some uh, postmodern sensitivities. Uh, but his heart is in this mythic mother Russia empire building um, 
conquer your enemies, uh, bend people to your will stage of development. One very simple bright line, a really important bright line in world politics today is the line between modern and pre-modern. So modern being modern and postmodern and pre-modern being you know, traditional or the warrior empire consciousness. And that's a very, very bright line that is um, you know, at war literally right now. And I thought that there was a, a, a really good op-ed today in the New York Times from John McWhorter. His uh, op-ed says, war puts our woes in perspective. And you can see, I think it's a very interesting graphic. It shows the outline of the United States, but it's actually a map of the Ukraine. So, or Ukraine, sorry about that. So here's what he writes. And I think it's... Uh, I'm, I'm seeing this kind of thinking. It's really very much developmental thinking. He just He's describing the pre-modern perspective and in a way how surprising it is for us modern people to see it enacted so you know, brutally, which pre-modern is brutal. So he writes, today with the grand conflagrations of World Wars I and II so distant in time, it's easy to think of war as something unnatural, antique. Wars big and small were so endemic to medieval Europe, for example, that peace was often what seemed peculiar. It's not an accident that the word peace traces back to Latin's pax, P-A-X, to refer to, quote, making an agreement, a pact, the idea of peace was once processed not as a steady state, as much as something achieved by reaching an accord between enemies. He goes on, he writes, but today, in addition to the immediate horrors, the death and destruction of Russia's offensive, we're confronted by the notion that war, the violent incursion into and potential occupation of a neighboring nation is perhaps still seen by President Vladimir Putin of Russia as something unexceptional, a normal state, just one among many tools of statecraft to be employed. He gives no indication that he considers what he is doing to be a reluctant last ditch strategy upending the natural status quo. To him rather, it's naked aggression, barely requiring justification and seemingly meant to satisfy his lust for territory and to redress what he senses as geopolitical humiliation after the end of the Cold War. And he goes on, last paragraph, I'll quote at least, he says, if it suits him, in other words, war is normal. Peace may be nice, but sometimes it must make way for war, even before desperation makes war a last resort. And here survives that medieval frame of mind, pre-modern frame of mind, under which one did not even think of the state of war as a tragic anomaly, a thing, but the normal state of how things are. And um, yeah, so I'm seeing more and more of that kind of thinking arising. You know, the, it, it, you know we, it's funny, we, after the the you know, original invasion, the world is um, sort of unified in its modern world, at least, is unified in its response. But we can see now you know, that people are finding their corners. And I see the um, critique of from particularly from the left of how, you know, Russia was pushed in this corner that NATO is after all a military treaty and from a pre-modern mind that that would be threatening in a way that we don't understand because, you know, we modern people just want to spread the good news that we can leave the ghosts of nationalism and religion and blood feuds behind and all join together in this modern world and trade and and uh, have fun and travel and be peaceful. And we underestimate, we continue to be surprised, I do, by the force that exists 
still in the pre-modern strata of our planet. You know, Ken Wilber would say that two thirds of the people on the planet are pre-modern. And I remember that always struck me. And, you know, I, 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 you, we would hope. And so far since World War II, the modern skin that has really come to fore has kept the pre-modern impulses in check. But, um, you know, there's a lot of life there yet. And um, I think we're all getting an existential nose rub in that reality. We got one a few years ago when Donald Trump was elected the president of the, of the United States. You know, he too representing this, you know, ethnocentric, religious of all things, I mean, really. But nevertheless, he was the, and is, the um, you know, standard bearer for that strata in our country. So, you know, in a way, um, less optimistic, if you will, or maybe more realistic, I'm letting in, you know, the power of the pre-modern. I mean, we're seeing it demonstrated with Putin. Uh, the Russian people are behind him. Uh, a lot of it's propaganda and a lot of it isn't. A lot of it's just, they, that's where they are too. Mother Russia means a lot to them. They really don't want to be knitted into the modern world the way uh, Ukraine does, for instance. There was a, a really interesting interview on uh, Fareed Zakaria, I think it was last week, and it was about the, uh, it was the, the ambassador to the UN from Kenya, I'm forgetting his name, but he gave a speech in the UN after the invasion of Ukraine and he made the point that in Africa, they decided to keep the boundaries that were drawn by the colonialists when they were left or driven out. Instead of redrawing boundaries around ethnic groups and religions and that sort of thing. So the boundaries drawn by the colonialists were indifferent to those things, also in the Middle East. So tribes were, you know, uh, separated and so forth. But, but the ambassador for Kemp, from, from Kenya said that Africans decided that it was better to just work with these boundaries than it would be to open up, you know, an endless series of medieval wars between tribes. And I thought that was really brilliant. I really hadn't thought of it that way. But... Um, now I'm thinking, well, I hope that we can, you know, again, that the, the modern strata can help usher these groups into the modern world uh, because you, they're going to find their soul. These tribes, the tribal soul is a thing. Modernity wants to think it isn't. Religion's a thing. Modernity wants to think it isn't. And this is where, you know, we really need integral consciousness not just modern consciousness, but integral consciousness, because we can hold it all, or at least that's the, you know, that's the ideal. There was, a, 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 I got an email a couple of days ago, I, I imagine many of you did as well, from Ben Segante in Hungary. He's um, the leader of the international, or of the integral European conference has, that they've done for uh, 10 years or so, every couple of years. And he announced that the new conference will be held this May 25th through 29th, and it will be on Zoom. Uh, the future conferences will be hopefully back in live space. But the, the topic of the conference coming up May 25th is world peace and you know, what Integral can bring to the party for world peace. And I was struck by a paragraph he wrote, and I'll just share it with you. He says, a post-postmodern integral wave has developed that suggests the awareness of not only the higher or later stages and their potential, but also the earlier stages and their dynamics. We need timely knowledge and also inner openness 
to include all stages of development into a larger complexity if we aim for local and global peace and ultimately world peace. So I couldn't say it any better than that. All right, so next from Gloria. And she's, uh, she says, I've been listening to your daily Evolver podcast on Ukraine. Thank you for bringing the integral higher consciousness and heart-centered perspective on this sad situation. She says, how about adding a look at this war in the context of the bigger picture of global crisis slash evolution? Regardless of the ugly politics on both sides that brought this about, the world, even Russians, seem to be more unified and sensitized in its abhorrence of war. And I think I agree with you, Gloria, that every, this, this is sensitizing everybody to the horrors of war. You know, I think it's worth noting that even the Russian propaganda that we see is not about we're crushing their cities and they're on the run and the streets are running in blood. And this would absolutely have been the propaganda of a true pre-modern conqueror culture. But today, uh, even the propaganda to the, to the Russian people is about you know, that, that it's peaceful, that it's, it's their fault, that we're the good guys. And it has to be delivered to the sensibility of people who have a higher stage of moral development. And again, simultaneity. The Russian people, like people in every culture, had, are lit up at all stages of development. And there's definitely a modern stage in, in Russian culture. There's a postmodern, there's an integral stage. You know, a lot of the Russians are involved in the integral movement. So yeah, I think we can note that everybody is, uh, nobody is talking about the glories of war here. So that's progress, right? Okay, next, this is from another longtime listener, Kathleen. And she's listening to my stuff on the Ukraine. And she says, I'm wondering about your emphasis on Ukrainians as being like us. And this, there's, I, was, I was quoting Zelensky as, when he was addressing the European Union. He was saying, if nothing else, what you've realized, what you've seen, what we've demonstrated is that we Ukrainians are just like you. And um, I thought that was notable. And uh, so she says that they're like us, similar to the developmental stage that we see ourselves to be in. Yes, modern and above, if you will. She goes on, though, and she says, I feel ashamed of my preference for people with blonde hair and blue eyes, and that I don't have the feelings that I judge I should have with people who don't look like me or think like me. How are you grappling with this? And I think it's a really, really excellent point. And um, there's really two points that she brings up. One is that we have a preference for people who look like us. I would say that to the degree that our ethnocentric traditional stage is vibing, that's true. And I think that preference is deep and in the early stages of humanity, earlier stages of humanity, somebody who looked like you would be a reasonable, intelligent clue for them being a friend versus a foe. Not necessarily, but it would be a clue. At modernity, that stops mattering so much for sure, because at least from a modern point of view, we're looking for a post-ethnic identity. We're looking to, for a post-ethnic connection with other people. We don't care what your grandfather did to my grandfather at the modern stage. Now, again, nobody's purely modern and everybody has simultaneity, you know, where everything's vibing at once. But that's the center of gravity that is happening at modern. That's the founding ideal of the United States. So that's modern. Now at postmodern, 
we actually start developing a preference for people who don't look like us because we're bored. We get the people who look like us. And now somebody who doesn't look like us is a clue for somebody being more interesting or somebody that I can learn from. And so I would unpack that idea of the preference for people who look like me and notice all of them at, at, operating at once in myself. And we can all do that. That's integral practice is to, just to do that. So that's the one thing she was talking about, people who look like me. The second is the preference for people who think like me. And this is the real rub. This is our preference for people who share our worldview. And that's really powerful to stageism, if you will. How that really shows up in the political situation right now is that the world is far more um, distraught, modern world, by the suffering of the Ukraine people than they were of, by the Afghan, the Afghan people, or the Syrians, or the uh, uh, Iraqis, or the people in Yemen. And part of that is, is that modern people relate to modern people, identify with more than they do with traditional people who are not post-ethnic. So traditional people in Syria, again, these cultures have a they have modern people, they have postmodern people, but the centers of gravity are traditional and sometimes earlier, even holy warrior down into the warrior stage. So assimilating Ukrainian refugees is going to be much easier than assimilating Afghan refugees. That's because, you know, traditional people import their traditional worldview which is ethnocentric, homophobic, not multicultural, sexist, theocratic, authoritarian, and modern people, you know, there's a, just a natural, wait a second here. And we can see what happens where we get these subcultures in modern cultures that are pre-modern. And, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's a reasonable political calculation to prefer modern people as refugees. It's not, however, a good moral calculation. And that's, I think, something that is coming clearer to all of us as we watch this. It's, it's like, wait a second, why am I so upset by this when I wasn't so upset about Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan? You know, I ought not care more about modern people than I do about traditional people. We ought to care for all people equally. And so, you know, there's, two calculations going, going on here, and they're both appropriate, one being the political one, one being the moral one. And that calls us to, you know, what, how can I do better here? What can I do for the Afghans? I don't necessarily want to import their problems, but I do want to care about them as much as I care about anybody else. And, you know, I think this itself is an awakening of people on the planet right now. And I think that's good. Yeah, so um, again, um, thank you for joining me. And it's my great privilege to share these ideas every week. And ongoing, it's gonna be Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. And it'll be just under the banner of the Daily Evolver a developmental take on the news. Simulcast on Integral Life's YouTube page and the Developmental Politics Facebook group uh, be simulcast and then it'll be posted on, on all three. So there you go. Okay, folks, thanks for listening and tuning in and we'll see you next time. See you on Wednesday. <laughs>